Right. Uh, thank you very much for coming tonight. Uh, the, uh, I'm going to be very quick. I know it's already almost eight o'clock, and I know that we don't want to stay for too long. So, so let's get straight to the point. My name is Wan Shaibul Wanjan. I'm chief executive of this group for democracy and economic affairs in short ideas. Uh, the topic tonight is liberalism and support against racism. So, um, I'm, we do this in KL to avoid rape by a Jais in Slango. Thank you very much to everyone here. Some of you will not understand that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just, uh, I, I want to start by saying thank you uh, to you all for, for attending the event. Uh, we have, uh, we're expecting even more people than what we have now. So, uh, you can just make sure there's no gap with the seats between you and uh, allow our people to come in uh, when you see them. I also want to say thank you very much to uh, the people who made possible the, the meeting. In fact, we do have the donor who funded all this, but on the advice of the Attorney General, I will not disclose that. Again, <laughs> <laughs> uh, very critically, it's going to be interesting. Uh, no, the, the funder for a slight event, uh, the funder, it's funny, but it's kind of community now. <laughs> Uh, the, the funder for tonight's event is Credit Common Foundation, uh, uh, which is a foundation for the legal party in Germany. And I really want to thank the uh, Credit Common Foundation, who is here as a country director for the uh, They are the ones who made it possible to have Mr. Busi uh, Maimane uh, from South Africa on the way to, to, to visit as a as a talk of his experience and made it possible for us to listen to the New York Arm as well, the New York Arm as well. But before we start uh, the program with uh, Mr. Mamani, I want to invite the uh, President of IDF to say a few words. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the invitation. I'll get to it like this. Um, of course, I'd like to welcome everyone uh, and our guests from South Africa uh, this evening. Last weekend, ideas was represented at a civil society roundtable with President Obama. And after that event, there was some disquiet that the head of state or government of a country should meet with such organizations like ourselves. And in my subsequent article, I pointed out that through uh, diplomatic missions, increasingly, many countries are engaging with Malaysian civil society. And I remarked that our own Miss Mapusha should, be also, should also be talking to civil society in countries where we have high commissions and embassies. And the reason is simple. Governments do not, well, governments at best, do not have a monopoly uh, on truth about what happens in their countries. At worst, they do their best to omit or subvert uh, the truth. Long-term bilateral relationships, especially those outside track one diplomacy, require conversations between governments, political parties, the business community, uh, as well as civil society. Tonight's example is another example of such diplomacy. When you think of the relationship between Malaysia and South Africa, you might think of our significant trade volume, the historical legacy of the King Malays, or the fact that Malaysia Airlines, once upon a time, had flights to Johannesburg. <laughs> but very few Malaysians, and probably very few South Africans, will recall that in 1960 and 1961, the Malayan Prime Minister, Tunku Abdul Rahman, attended the Commonwealth Prime Minister's Conference in London, where he powerfully opposed the apartheid policy of South Africa and organized the boycott of South African goods. The press secretary in the Prime Minister's Department, Frank Sullivan, uh, gave an account of this incident to the Kuala Lumpur Rotary Club, uh, which is reproduced in a book, uh, Tribute to Tinkar Abdul Rahman, published in 1963. I'm just going to quote uh, three paragraphs from that book. The government of South Africa has been carrying out the policy of apartheid for 12 years, but in nine months or so, immediately before the conference, apartheid was attracting general concern in many parts of the world, owing to the excessive rigor uh, used in enforcing every letter of the law. The South African government obstinately refused to listen to the protests, continuing to act with blind contempt of the Declaration of Human Rights. One of the very first to protest was our Prime Minister, Tunkhas Abdul Rahman. He sent an immediate telegram to Prime Minister Macmillan, deploring the action of the South African police in shooting down unarmed men, women and children, and he asked for the agenda of the Commonwealth Conference in London to include discussion on apartheid. Six weeks later in London, at the very first session of the conference, Tunku kept his promise. He raised the question of apartheid. The South African Minister for External Affairs, Mr. Lau, uh, later declared factly that South Africa intended to stand by apartheid. Tuku later put out a press conference, again denouncing apartheid and a further private and secret 
uh, conference between the Prime Ministers was held, which resulted in a communique stating that the racial situation of South Africa was discussed. Close quote. The journalist Francis Curie observed that when the Tuku came out openly condemning South Africa's apartheid policies, uh, his more experienced colleagues halted and hesitated. He was defending the right against powerful interests. And partly as a result of his efforts, South Africa was prevented from being a member of the Commonwealth from 1961 until the end of apartheid in 1994. Now, Nelson Mandela was aware of the Tunku's efforts, and after his release from prison in 1990, the Tembu prince asked to meet the Kedah prince when he visited Malaysia that year. Unfortunately, Malaysian domestic political interests prevented that meeting from taking place, as the Tunku was supporting the opposition at the time, Samangat 46, uh, and he passed away a month later. Now, I understand, Mr. Mamane, that while your, uh, your political party is not Mandela's political party, you still respect and revere Madiba. In the same way, we at Ideas are certainly independent of the Tunku's political party, but we respect and revere our father of independence. And as a bit of a coincidence of dates, today is the 3rd of December. Uh, uh, Mandela passed away on the 5th of December. Uh, Tunku Abdul Rahman passed away on the 6th of December. So maybe this means something. Um, <laughs> in Malaysia, just as in South Africa, we are dealing with legacies of a past that so many in the present wish to interpret in racial terms. Uh, trust me, we know all about how racial language can be used to justify patron-client relationships, cronyism, and money politics. We know all about how policies derived from noble intentions for the equitable uh, distribution of wealth amongst ethnically defined communities can degenerate, uh, can degenerate into tools for oppression and fostering an environment of dependence. We know all about how politics defined in racial terms can lead to the erosion of institutions that serve to check and balance the executive. Of course, you are a political party that seeks to possess executive power, or we are a think tank that hopes to shift the debate, influence public opinion, and ultimately the agendas of all political parties. So I make no comment on the state of politics in your country, uh, but I think we all look forward to hearing from your experience, uh, your take on the issues, and how you intend to move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Godwin. There's a lot of similarities, as you can hear, historically speaking, uh, between the two countries, and I'm sure we're going to explore more. So what we're going to do now is we're going to listen from uh, Mr. Musi Maimane, uh, who's the leader of the Democratic Alliance. Uh, I, I'm not going to do the long introduction, because I'm sure when we receive our invitation, we are going to receive that you know, five paragraph of uh, background information uh, about Mr. Maimane. So let us now welcome Mr. Musi Mamani to, to the stage. Uh, all right, I'll just stand. Good evening, everybody. Good to see everybody, and it's great to be here in Malaysia. It's my first trip ever to uh, Asia. Uh, at least I've been to Taiwan, and I know I shouldn't be saying that all publicly, but uh, <laughs> but it's great to be here in Malaysia and certainly I've enjoyed meeting everybody. Thank you to Ideas for putting together tonight's event and uh, certainly have enjoyed the food here. Uh, it's fantastic and the people are fantastic. But the subject of discussion today is one that speaks about liberalism as a force against racism. A nation born out of deep racism. I think without doubt, your affirmation absolutely uh, is correct in saying that South Africa as a nation was born out of a deep, dark form of racism. That, as a post-colonial society led by one liberation movement in the form of the National Party, who then instituted apartheid laws that sought to divide people on the basis of race, that when we arrived in 1994, the founding question was how do you ensure that out of the ashes of apartheid, a united, prosperous nation will occur? And that informs the fundamental question that is before us. And I think, because of the limited time I have tonight, I want to just unpack a few thoughts and ideas, and then perhaps maybe we can be able to unpack many more subjects as we go into a Q&A session. But there's some key fundamentals that we need to understand, is that there are, in essence, in South Africa today, many multiple political parties. There is now the African National Congress, which is the party of President Nelson Mandela began ultimately fighting for a struggle for a non-racial South Africa, the question must stand whether does the ANC of today still represent a picture of non-racism 
as was articulated by President Nelson Mandela and whether or not there must be a maturation of that question. The second is obviously the Democratic Alliance, the party that I lead, that has successfully grown literally since 1994 out of elections starting off at 1.7% and now today leading a party, uh, a percentage of the vote of about 23%, which represents in our national parliament about 102 members of parliament. That in and of itself as a party was born out of an opposition to apartheid, similar a little bit to some of the challenges we've got here, represents, uh, has been historically tarred as a party that only represents a particular race group. But our project today is a project that we're building a non-racial society uh, born out of a number of values. The third conversation is the party called the EFF. Now, the Economic Freedom Fighters, I like to call them the ANC in drag. Because in many ways, this is a political party that is stemmed out of the ANC, led by an ANC youth leader, uh, Julius Malema, who's then set up a political front that really mobilizes on the basis of race. And it's within that context that our political discussion takes place. I think without fail, if you were to reflect to prior 1994 in South Africa, apartheid was a system that not only oppressed black South Africans, but systematically miseducated them and set them up for a life of economic exclusion, almost in many ways, for generations to come. I'm a child of parents who, my mother knows very well what it's like to jump out of a moving train, fight fleeing away from the violent attacks of police. My father, who is smarter than me, when I finished high school and did my first degree, I was the most qualified in my own home. Therefore, to both parents who worked as middle, I wouldn't call them even middle class people, but as workers, as blue collar workers, I can understand that in fact apartheid had profound consequence for their lives. It's having some for me. And that's why I place into context the fact that as a South African today, the question of racism is still well and alive with us. If you were to look at the context in 1994, that system still divides. Oh, sorry. The system is that okay? All right. The system still divided so many on the basis of race. But here are the fundamental issues that perhaps maybe the project of 1994 had to achieve: is how do you bring the two divided nations together so that you can build one? And I use the word two worlds because in many ways there existed two worlds. There was one world that was white that perhaps opened up opportunities and had money and wealth. And, and perhaps in fact a quality education. And there was another that was black, characterized in the main by informal settlements, disempowerment, a poor education system, and lack of work opportunities. The world only met as a function of exploitation even subsequent to 1994, where in many ways you could attract people and black South Africans were seen as laborers, while white South Africans were seen as those who are managers and those who are in charge of the economy. The project of 1994 therefore had to answer the question, how do you bring that together? And I think the first starting point, like in any other democracy, must begin with the notion that, in fact, the constitution of the republic remains a supreme document that guides the principles of that country. And when President Nelson Mandela took over and signed the constitution in 1995, where we'll next year be celebrating the 20th anniversary of our constitution, in its preamble it says, for South Africa shall belong to all who live in it, black or white. Which was a profound statement of an acknowledgement of the rights of human beings, the rights to property, the rights to freedom of association, the right to freedom of speech, the notion that individuals in the country shall continue to thrive and claim legitimacy in the nation. Now what gave birth to that spirit of Nelson Mandela to be able to say after having been jailed for such a long period of time, he simply did not come back to attack a process of race engineering by engineering yet another racist me uh, mechanism to attack the very first. What inspires that? And here's what I believe was true, must remain true today. If you were to rewind the same movie to 1956, when President Nelson Mandela and many political prisoners were arrested in the first treason trial, President Nelson Mandela and many others understood that they weren't fighting against the race, but they were fighting against the system. Apartheid, however racist it was, was a system that systematically marginalized people 
and ultimately forced us into a belief that it was against the people, but it needed to be about a system, a system that marginalizes others. And so in 1956, the Trinism trial that first started was by a group of people who were from different races and different cultures coming together to fight against an oppressive system. Therefore, it highlights the fact that the victory in 1994 was in many ways not a victory of black people against white people, it was a victory of South Africans against the system that marginalized and oppressed other South Africans. So as I stand here before you today, the first point of departure about race must be one where you say, I recognize, you must recognize, I always say when people say to me, but Mr. My Mind, we must live in a colorblind society. I say that's absolute nonsense. You must be able to see that I'm black and I have a history. For if you don't see that I'm black, you don't see me. That is part of my story. That is the legacy with which I come from. But the society with which I want to build is one where the color of your skin will only matter as far as the shape of your nose. <laughs> or that ultimately, when we talk about race, it becomes a question of that the only race that must matter must be the human race. So, as a point of departure and maturation, in 1994 we had to agree to the Constitution and what the Constitution stood for. The second of the issues was that there were many challenges around land, which I'm sure you can appreciate today, for the best land was left for white South Africans, and the worst, in many ways, in Bantustan was left for black South Africans. If you are going to address the question of race and answer the question, surely the Constitution gives us the guiding light that says property rights for individuals must be protected. What has happened subsequently is that the ANC of today has come to a belief that no, rather than giving property rights to individuals, so that individuals can be in charge of their own destinies, the ANC has created a world in which tribal chiefs are now in charge of rural land, and ultimately what it means is that it's replaced the former system of Bantu stands with another new lot of traditional leaders so that black South Africans are still oppressed within the system. So you can't argue the case that the best way to address a nationalist system that was driven by a national party is to replace it by another nationalist system driven by the African Nationalist Congress, which is what the ANC stands for. Third to the issue, and the issue of land is still crucial, because for many South Africans today, I believe that if we are going to build an integrated, non-racial society in South Africa, we must give the rights to property particularly to South Africans who are left out. And so for many, even in this instance, one of the policy failures of the ANC is that they fail to secure property rights for individuals by giving them title to land, which is something that was requisite. And I believe that people have lived in a particular ground for a long period of time. What is the just and the right thing to do is to be able to give them land so that there's material assets for people to trade against as South Africans as a starting point. The second question was about how do you then transform the economy which benefited some at the expense of the many. And I argued the case to say this, that the ANC then took on many pieces of legislation subsequent to President Nelson Mandela, driven by President Thabo Mbeki, where he reintroduced the idea that in fact he better to define what an African is because he defined an African as a black African, rather than in fact defining an African with someone with an origin or birth from South Africa or Africa, which indeed can become a problem even in a democracy such as yourselves. Because if you are not careful, you run the risk of in fact undermining those who have been born here, who have lived here, but because they are not Malays in the sense you could argue the case that they are perhaps not people who come from this place. Our philosophical view is that by definition of being African means you were born in the continent, you are the child of the soil, and that the color of your skin is only secondary to that issue. That first and foremost, indeed, we are all Africans. And by virtue of being able to hold a South African passport, and you are engaged with issues of Africa, that locates you as an African, and therefore you must contest within an African space. Furthermore, the policies that were then introduced began with issues such as triple B, double E, or B, E, E, which is black economic empowerment. 
the suggestion that in fact the ANC government had the capacity to manipulate outcomes rather than to deal with the inputs. And here's what I mean. We will debate in a moment the difference between employment equity and affirmative action. The idea that employment equity said this, that the ANC said we will take racial representativity in places of work and then divide management on that basis or divide people who work. It forced South Africans to give these compliance forms that said to people, in your place of work, if 70% of the people in the population are black, 10% white, 10% Indian, 10% colored, and those are hypothetical numbers, then your workspace must represent the same. The challenge with that view is that you then put the burden back on the company for it to prove that this particular person is in fact black, that particular person is in fact white, and that is no different in my humble opinion to the old pencil test that was introduced under apartheid that said that the only way we can tell if someone is black is if we can put a pencil through your head and if your hair, if the pencil stays in your head, then you are indeed black and if it did not, then you are not. The new legislation, in fact, reintroduces the idea of racism, which was a struggle in South Africa in the first place. The second concept is how do you widen inclusivity? How do you ensure that those who are left out of the economy are included in a systematic sort of way? Unfortunately, it created as a key focus the idea of ownership in the BE legislation. And when you look at just ownership alone, it meant that you then attract crony capital. Those who are politically connected and the political elite were the only ones who benefited from the sort of tenders that were being issued. Ladies and gentlemen, I stand today as a firm believer in the fact that, yes, the struggle in 1994 was to defeat a system that racially excluded people. Today, we must deal with the exclusionary mechanisms of today. And the exclusionary mechanisms of South Africa today is that for far too many, the quality of their education is still inferior. In fact, the provision of education for poor South Africans is still poorer than that of white South Africans. The problem with BEE is that maybe as an unintended consequence, but I think it could have been foreseen, is the fact that as many black South Africans who benefited from BEE, there are still as many white South Africans who benefited. So the policy did not achieve what it sought to achieve. Our view is simply this, that yes, we understand that there's a historical legacy that must be addressed. But imagine this, what if you created a new coding system that said, let's address the question of inclusion from an inputs point of view rather than an outputs point of view. And by inputs, this is what I mean. Can we develop a quality labor force in South Africa of South Africans who are better educated than they were before? My fight as a party is that we deal with Bantu education, which was an education system given by the apartheid government to black South Africans. My view today is this, when you come to rural communities and places like that, it is unlikely that those who are left out of the economy are going to compete in a better way. So if you're going to address racial inequality, deal with the question of education. And I'm proposing that in fact there must be better scoring that is put to companies to say, rather than you giving shares to your politically connected people, why don't you put private education in communities that didn't have private education amongst the poor? so that we ultimately end up with a populace that is better educated. If you deal with interventions that deal with the poor, you can ultimately address a system where the benefactors of poverty, of those who are poor, will ultimately be black. That's a factual reality. The third dynamic given around me is the fact that the ANC then adopted a policy that said they wanted to introduce a hundred black industrialists. That's, a, that's the pronouncement coming from the president. The problem with creating a hundred black industrialists is that all you end up creating is a hundred black fat cats. <laughs> the question could be better phrased by saying why don't you create thousands if not millions of micro enterprise to which the majority of would ultimately be black. If we dealt, if the argument in South Africa is to say how do you address a historical injustice, surely the imperative of growth cannot be disassociated for that. For you cannot redistribute what is not growing. And the view of the ANC was to say, let's redistribute even if it wasn't growing. 
And I'm arguing the case to say, let's create growth so that ultimately it can be redistributed to benefit many more South Africans. It's about not ensuring that there's these transactional EE deals that fail ultimately to create employment. Your, your problem, I mean, you've got a, a staggering level of unemployment. It is now sitting at 30%, if I'm not mistaken. That's shocking. In South Africa, unemployment is at 35%, just to place these things in context. 50% of the people who are unemployed are, in fact, young South Africans. 70% of those are black youth. So the policies have not achieved the function of creating an inclusive economy in the way that they were supposed to. But ladies and gentlemen, along with that, there are still questions in South Africa that when you deal with the rights of people and their ability to be able to speak up their, for their government, it requires that there must be a systematic engagement of how you socially create a society that is truly non-racial. Now, South Africa has a colonial history, an apartheid history, and a liberation history. All of those have got symbols in the country. There are statues of Rhodes, Cecil John Rhodes, the epitome of indeed colonialism. There are statues of people like even Fervut, the architect of apartheid. And there are statues of people like Nelson Mandela, in fact the father of our freedom. The question becomes, if you take a liberal point of view and you say, let the people be able to decide. Surely, we must acknowledge the history, build on it, and create a society where the various histories are expressed in any given nation. There are some who are trying to mobilize on the basis of race that are simply saying, no, the statues of Cecil John Rhodes and the statues of Herwood must disappear. Now, if you hold that view, believe you me, if I've learned anything, is that history does tend to repeat itself. And it's only a matter of time, as Julius Malema has already started saying, Nelson Mandela was a sellout. If his party was to take over power, I wonder if they wouldn't in future stand up and say, let the statue of Nelson Mandela also fall or be removed in the same narrative. Certainly, if you are going to build a democratic society, you have to ensure that the histories of the individuals are expressed and given a sense at which the freedoms, because the freedom of expression only is tested when we disagree, not when we agree. Because when we agree, it's easy. But when we disagree, we can stand up and say, I may not like that history, but I hold its right to stand. It's the same for language. Here, you've adopted uh, English and Malay as two languages that you stand for. In South Africa, there are 11 languages, each of them given constitutional imperative. Afrikaans was a language that was associated with apartheid. It then became a language of instruction in many universities. I don't like Afrikaans personally. <laughs> but the constitution of the republic guarantees that South Africans who want to speak in Afrikaans must be protected. And therefore, if you are going to build a non-racial society, a liberal society, you need to be able to take the stance that says, if there are South Africans who desire to speak that language and stand for it, their rights must be protected. And there are others who are simply creating a race-based mobilization that says those languages cannot exist, those cultures cannot exist, that history cannot exist, which is the shortest way of undermining our constitutional democracy. But furthermore, I believe that the project of non-racialism surely must be addressed through economic growth. But when we talk about policies like affirmative action, we rather see them as issues of how do you build diverse workspaces? How do you create opportunities for more people? And that is about addressing education from primary school level all the way to university level. Now I know here you took a position that said a certain level of quota must be allowed at certain universities. South Africa took a different stance. And I think that stance is very much better proof. Our biggest university, Vet University and perhaps UCT, in the main are diverse universities simply because the culture of the country and the population allows more people to gain access. So our view is this. Rather than setting a quota on the basis of race, 
Weren't you set a quota such as this one as an example? If you were to say, let 10% of all the students in yeah. South Africa into university and give them access and create diverse places and a diverse labor force. Because yes, universities must remain autonomous, but they are not only competing amongst themselves, they are competing in a global environment to create more PhDs and to create an economy in South Africa that can respond. So we take the stance progressively. Lastly, I think if you don't acknowledge the right of individuals and treat race and say people must think the same or be the same, you end up with ridiculous arguments that I hear every day in Parliament. Not only do I get called a sellout, or it's becoming a nice title now, because if Mandela was called a sellout, then I'm called a sellout, so it kind of works. Right? <laughs> but I'm called one who defends white minority capital. Or I'm married to a white South African. Our children are mixed race. I suppose, or colored to come back to South Africa. The challenge in that regard is that people say, because you are married to a white South African, you can't be black. <laughs> you know, in South Africa, you end up having debates like, this person is not black enough. You don't hear white people standing around going, hey, I'm white enough, or I'm not white enough. <laughs> The debate goes further by saying if a black South African is educated and has a different accent, then they can't be black. <laughs> Almost as though success is only something that must be given to white South Africans. It works on both sides of the story. In that when my wife and I walk around in a shopping center and we bump into a black South African, sometimes they look at me and they say, shoot, you've done well. <laughs> How have I done well? Oh, because you are going to a white South African, you've done well. <laughs> it creates this racial stereotyping that eventually undermines the rights of individuals. But where it's worse, it undermines freedom of association. Suddenly you've got political parties that are either for black South Africans or for white South Africans. If you create that culture, it means that there can be no integration and there can be no contestation of ideas. It will always be a fight of identities rather than ideas. Ladies and gentlemen, honorable members, South Africa must compete in a globalized environment. Therefore, we must answer some difficult questions, such as can we create a population that can compete with anyone in the world? And that has got consequences on the basis of language. For example, if our kids are educated in English, as an example, could they in fact compete against labor? Because I always tell South African workers, I say to them, you are not competing against fellow South African workers. You are competing against Chinese workers. And I tell you why that is. South Africa will import goods that are made from China. And if China can prove the case that they can produce whatever we want at a lower price than what South African labor can produce it at, believe you me, the competition is between labor in South Africa and labor in China. So we have to become a competitive country that is able to maximize its resources. So how do we do it as a party? And I close with this, Chairman. We want to build a values-based culture. Because we believe as a political party it's possible to stand for values regardless of your race. We've adopted those in our party's constitution and it's called freedom, fairness, and opportunity. Our argument is this, is that if you value freedom, regardless of what color you are, the value of freedom says you uphold the rights to, be, to, to individuals. You give people the right to choose. You fight for the fact that people can be able to say, regardless of where I choose to live, who I choose to marry, how I choose to self-identify is a freedom no one should ever be able to take away from me. What religion I so choose to practice remains my freedom that I will not have anyone take away. And ultimately, when I fight with the ANC, those people say to me, but the ANC is still the party of Mandela. I say, no. It's a party that has now entered into a space of populism and racial populism, not for the benefit of the people they intend to benefit, but really as a pragmatic exercise of staying into power. 
It's no different to gerrymandering. It's no different to purchasing the media. It's no different. It's just policies that say, so long as we can stand up and say we are for black people in a country where the majority of people are black, you are then creating an environment where ultimately you can stay in power for longer. It's not a question of ultimately governing so that the very people you are discussing can be empowered for the better. So my argument is that even at that, those policies are insincere and worst of all, divided at best. Secondly, is we've said we want to build a fair society. Now I take leave, as I shared with someone earlier on this afternoon, from the Black Lives Matter campaign in the US. You see, that campaign is fascinating. Because here are black and white Americans marching against racial polarization by police of black people. I like that campaign because it identifies that the issue is racial profiling, but those who mobilize for it are non-racial. I recognize that in South Africa, inferiority is still a racial issue, but those who must fight against inferiority and inequality cannot be one race, it must be a plethora of races. Because whether I like it or not, if you simply say it must be this race or that race, capital outflights in South Africa are severe, the skill deficit is still quite, quite strong, therefore it will take all of us together to be able to address the, the challenges there. So we say as a party we want to build a fair society, a society where opportunities are open for all, where we build one nation with one future, where ultimately we recognize that together we're better than we are apart. That the rights of individuals are held, that where there are historical injustices of issues of land, we can give title to those who don't have land, we can ensure that we address those who are poor, so that ultimately poverty is not a provision of race, just as much as skill is not a provision of another race. So at our Congress in February next year, in fact not our Congress, but our council meeting, I will be tabling a paper that speaks about fairness and a fair society. But the last thing is that we must talk about an opportunity society, which is to say South Africa can become a beacon of hope in the continent, which is to say we can open up opportunities for more people. That yes, people will be critical and say, why, Mr. Maimai, do you support some elements of affirmative action? I only support them because they, if, if the principle is this, then in fact, if there are two competing candidates of different races, but they are equal skill and equal competence, then you must choose the one from a category of South Africa that have been left out. Because ultimately, our workspaces are not diverse enough. The ultimate picture is to build diverse society. But along with that, we want to force industry to say, if you are willing to put money in training engineers who have a particular race, we must give you an incentive. If you are willing to create jobs in South Africa, we must give you more points in the same way as we would for the question of ownership. So we want to stand strong on the ideas of opportunity. And ladies and gentlemen, the true test of any democracy is whether or not power can shift from one party to the next. And I certainly believe without faith that if South Africa is going to survive and see itself through this particular period now that is increasing the tensions of racism, we have to ultimately build a non-racial party that will stand up again for the principle of Nelson Mandela. And I believe that dream is alive, and it is now only alive within the DA. Yes, it's a much harder process. Henry Kissinger argues the case to build a party that is non-racial is far harder than building one that is homogenous in terms of race. But I certainly believe if we can prove the point, and as we've shown the growth, and we're looking at governing in more cities, I believe that we can prove the case for many South Africans that says non-racialism and a fight in a liberal context, a constitutional democracy that is up against populism, will ultimately overcome. And we will replace this liberation movement as we did the former one by building a party that represents more of what Nelson Mandela wanted, a non-racial future for all. I hope you can look forward to that because that's the truth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ramani. I'm not sure how to comment on that, to be honest. You know, how do I join? But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you want to set up a party here, maybe? No. <laughs> um, right, okay. 
I think there's so many points that have been raised in, in the, that presentation. We're going to hear from Dr. Uh, 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 uh There are so many points that have been raised, especially uh, and including on the issue of BEE. Just in case you miss you miss out, uh, you know when when uh, Mr. Mamani referred to BEE as yes, uh, producing chromism, uh, producing you know, uh, black fat cats, uh, as he said just now, and perpetuating inequality and not really solving the issues. I really want to make sure you understand that BEE is referring to is. Black Economic Empowerment Agenda. Not to be confused with the Bumi Putra Economic Empowerment Agenda. <laughs> Just nothing to do with all the cats and what we now. Just to make sure that I'm safe, I don't get arrested. <laughs> so, so now let's hear from uh, Dr. Di Hock Aung, um, who is a senior lecturer from University of Malaya, has done a lot of work in comparing the two countries. So, Hock Aung. Thank you very much, Dr. I guess, due to the wiring, I have to stand in the middle. <laughs> Thank you, Owen Seifold, and uh, to uh, uh, Mr. Maimani. Uh, it's, uh, it's an honor to share the stage with you, and thank you for uh, sharing uh, with us. And uh, I was also thinking along the same lines, and it was cool to want to set up uh, a Demo uh, Democratic Alliance uh, Mal uh, KL chapter can meet here after <laughs> our meeting. <laughs> South Africa. I thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, South Africa has a special place in my heart. Uh, as once I've said, I've, I've done some comparative work, um, research on Malaysia and South Africa, and specifically on the affirmative uh, action policies. And what drew me to that is probably you know, it's, it, a lot of the themes that have, have already been raised tonight, how the countries are multicultural, multiracial, and in particular, that uh, at the formation of the nation, um, <clears throat> For Malaysia, 1957, Malay Independence, 1963, uh, formation of uh, Malaysia with the merger of Peninsula Sabah and Sarawak. And here I'm referring to the formation of a demo democratic post apartheid uh, South Africa. We, we share this commonality where there's an economically disadvantaged uh, but politically dominant uh, ethnic majority. So I was really uh, really captivated by that and uh, also I was just so bored of only studying Malaysia and it's such a beautiful country I wanted an excuse to visit uh, which I did uh, spent some time there to go see for, for myself as I looked around in South Africa and also reading and just a lot of contemplation though uh, differences started to emerge and actually it, towards the end it was the differences a little bit more prominent than, than the uh, similarities I just want to draw out three that, uh, that I have observed, I think, that are important for, for context. Uh, differences between Malaysia and South Africa, in spite of, of course, the very startling uh, similarity. And there are very few countries in the world in this kind of situation. Uh, Fiji would be another, uh, as, and Namibia, but also that have implemented affirmative action in favor of the majority. But one is on the constitution, and that was a uh, uh, reference uh, by uh, uh, Mr. Manmani, South Africa's constitution uh, drafted in, in the 90s, um, as far as 1996. Uh, you know, is, is this paragon of a democratic, uh, liberal, progressive uh, constitution? And I just want to highlight a particular uh, interesting contrast. Uh, we are aware of Article 153. Uh, which is the provision for um, measures that can be taken, reservation in university and uh, public sector employment on the basis of special position of the Malays and the natives of Sabah and Sarawak. So giving stress to that, the basis for it, based on uh, special position uh, of a group. South Africa's constitution provides for these uh, measures that is, uh, preferential uh, measures on the basis of a group that have been um, disadvantaged through unfair discrimination. Of course, that translates into blacks, but also women and the disabled. Um, so th that, uh, that, that to me, in my, in my reading, had uh, there was a consistency from that, that, that being the, you know, the, the basis translated into policies that, that were worded in a way that has a little bit more checks and balances um, that is not just granting uh, preferences uh, indefinitely to a particular uh, identity. So uh, now, 
in practice, yes, some of us there are, there's a lot of uh, similarities. But I think uh, we to 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 step back a bit and, and to go back to to the foundation. I think that's an important uh, uh, point to note. And I think the debate that can happen in in South Africa really, um, unfortunately, we cannot really have it here because it's also seditious. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> and it, it's the word right in, in a way that is you know very just obvious and, and clear okay and uh, and whereas when it's more conceptual there can be a little bit more of debate the other difference is uh, in, in the transition when South Africa uh, from apartheid to uh, democracy it went from minority and apartheid rule to uh, yeah, the, uh, the democratic system, and obviously the um, uh, black um, vote would carry its proportionate uh, weight. So I'm, I'm, uh, I, I, you know, it went in, in simplistic terms, right, from from a, a white rule towards you know uh, the black majority's voice being reflected uh, in in government, and it was a democratized democratization process, which resulted in a lot of the policies uh, under this banner of affirmative action, um, taking a legislative route. So you've mentioned the Employment uh, Equity Act, that economic empowerment is also based on a piece of legislation and it's, uh, it, it's, it's codified. Um, it, it, it's very distinct and different from Malaysia, which was a more discretionary approach, whereby the executive branch of government just dictated. We didn't go through a parliamentary process or, or, or a debate. Right. So there's a little bit of being your worst critic here, and I'm just highlighting some of the things about uh, 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 about uh, Malaysia, uh, and and it, it, you know you don't have it so bad in South Africa. It can be a lot worse. Um, the, the third thing is about the, some differences in in, in 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 politics, and I'll get to another one uh, right here. So the the DA has uh, 23 percent of the vote which translates into 23% of parliament seats. It's a proportional system. That's an interesting contrast. Um, the ANC has 62% of the vote, the popular vote, and 62% of parliament seats. Marcia National has, uncannily, 62%. Is it 62? Thereabouts of parliament seats. And how many percent of the popular vote? Was it 47? 48? Okay, that we're going back to the uh, 2013 elections. Uh, ours is a story of disproportionalities. I mean, we're not the only country. Unfortunately, uh, I think South Africa had, uh, I know there was a lot of debate in what kind of system, and, and in, the, in the end, with a lot of expert consultation, it was, uh, it was proportionate, and I think there's, there's a lot of wisdom in that. It's, it's not perfect, it has its flaws as well, but one of its flaws is certainly not disproportionality because it is, by definition, uh, proportionate. And so there are these uh, democratic institutions um, in, 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 in South Africa. And, and, uh, and here I just want to make then the first point about some lessons that can be, can be uh, drawn and both ways. I think it's good that we're looking to South Africa because very rarely um, in the conversation does uh, Malaysia look to South Africa to, uh, to, to draw lessons. Most of the, what I have seen and heard it just runs uh, it's a one-way street in the other direction. Oh, what can Malaysia teach uh, South Africa? Malaysia, and primarily in the economic sphere and its economic uh, policies. But there's really a lot that can go both ways, and I think actually I will be drawing a lot more what Malaysia could take from South Africa, and what South Africa can learn from Malaysia, mostly by not doing what we do. So, <laughs> now, highlighting that, now it's not just about the electoral system, uh, things like uh, the elections are not tainted, you know, with uncleanness and uh, uh, you know, suspicions about the, the fairness. The electoral commission, I, I think, is, is uh, believed to be uh, fair and impartial. Media uh, is is free. Uh, if some of you have been uh, have Google or you uh, and checked on YouTube, uh, my money's uh, spectacular speeches. Some of them uh, in, in in parliament. Wow. Yeah, wow. And wow, that one wow is that, and the other wow is why didn't the speaker intervene? How can the speaker allow the leader of the opposition to dress down the president in the chamber? So again, 
Wow. Okay. Wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you, you don't have it so bad. <laughs> In Malaysia, I don't know what would have happened to the leader of the opposition. I just do not know. Uh, <laughs> so, but on that note, this being 21 years after transition in 1994, and looking back at Malaysia 20 years after 1957, the Election Commission was already undermined, wasn't independent. Uh, anymore. And around about the time, maybe 20, 30 years, the media was also not. So uh, I guess it's a bit of a cautionary note to really fiercely defend and guard those because this is, these are some that uh, have been lost in Malaysia. But related then to the topic as well, because I think uh, liberalism and, and um, I think one of the things that it, it, it can offer, I think we will have disagreements, you know, but uh, one of those that, that I think we can uh, firmly uh, agree on is that um, liberalism, with its emphasis on freedom, on the dignity of uh, the individual, um, it's very fundamental for the constitution and the law to be guaranteeing those. And that is a basis to uh, engage with people on, a, on, a, on, on an equal basis. And that, will be a, that it provides a very strong basis as well to combat uh, racism. Uh, speaking of which, there's also some of this legislation in South Africa that uh, we don't have in Malaysia. This uh, uh, Prevention of Unfair, Promotion of Inequality and Prevention of Unfair Discrimination Act. Um, it specifies some way, uh, you know, the boundaries. It sets boundaries on, you know, on, on how, uh, on, on, like, I guess boundaries on speech, that if you transgress, that's where you're getting into the territory of racism. <laughs> And, and we, we really need that here because we do talk about it a lot, but also very loosely, and we don't have a legal uh, framework for it. The Employment Equity Act has the first part that it also provides some legal parameters on what constitutes unfair uh, discrimination. So that's a, quite a you know a, 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 mature, a more mature conversation that uh, South Africa has had, it's continuing to, but it's already in some of its laws, and I think uh, worthy for uh, Malaysia to uh, uh, emulate. So yeah, there is some that we can do, and again, don't do as much of what we did in the political and democratically regressing uh, sphere. Uh, the second one, I, I think I'm going to move on towards use that a bit, maybe depart a little bit, a bit critical, um, that visiting Malaysia, and I think you, you have met uh, um, our people in, from the DAP, which I also cannot help but uh, notice there's other resemblances besides the acronym. So there's the DA, Democratic Alliance in South Africa, and in Malaysia, the Democratic uh, Action Party. We have two parties that uh, I'm sure they will also agree are values-based, that are founded on a certain uh, ideology. They are distinct from other parties that have a much more racial flavor, or in the case of Malaysia, are outrightly uh, race-based parties. However, these are two parties in the, uh, throughout most of history and still in the current uh, context for which the electoral base is very still racially defined. Uh, predominantly a white electoral base for the, for the DA and for the DAP in, in Malaysia. Uh, it's from Chinese and urban and middle class. So if you just right, uh, swap those categories around, there, there's, there's quite a startling um, similarity there, and yet these are not parties. It's not a Chinese party. It doesn't define itself as as a white party. So it's 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 quite it's interesting. Uh, it's ironic. It's um, it's. I'm just making this more as, as as an observation. Actually, I would like to hear further about you know how you, you would see the the, the DA uh, negotiating that. Uh, I think it's it is moving in the direction of being less uh, white based uh, and. Um, made some, some gains in, 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 in the elections as well, and I think there's there's some excitement and momentum uh, carrying forward. But at the same time, if you know there, 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 there's also a balance that I'm sure you have have to strike. And similar with the DAP, you have a certain base to which issues of uh, meritocracy, right, and equal opportunity, those are the ones that resonate, and you cannot push the envelope too far without alienating them. And yet you also want to reach out to to others. So maybe it, 
I may, I, I'm going to ask, I'm going to just go ahead and ask you a question then. <laughs> you could, you know, I would really like to hear, I'm sure many of us would be interested uh, to know as well how, how you uh, negotiate that, that balance. Now coming to uh, black uh, economic empowerment and uh, race-based policies uh, more, more generally. I think it's, a very, it's important to go back to the, um, the origin, the context in which uh, they emerged, in, and the kind of climate. Uh, they have emerged in many countries. The first point, that countries that, that uh, realized that prohibiting discrimination well, did not suffice to promote the advancement of a particular group, blacks in the U.S. Uh, in, in uh, you know, and in the first instance, or that's where a lot of this is coming out, the, the, the writings as well as the term um, affirmative action. So that's not something to be discounted. That uh, you know, because the experience has been that uh, just prohibiting discrimination is not sufficient. If we just emphasize merit, right? Uh, then what result will you get? Well, you will get merit-based selection. But you may find that the progress of the blacks into university, into the higher level positions, into business, would be very slow. And so it, what's important to note is when the, these, these policies okay, um, were conceived, when they were institutionalized, there were, right, uh, very high expectations of change. I just cannot imagine in 1994 and you know through that kind of struggle, the expectancy, and then you also had in South Africa very, very brutal discrimination and in the workplace was also particularly acute. How could a government at that time just say, okay, now we'll just go with we won't look at race, we'll be race blind. And, um, you know, so blacks, you're free to apply, and we will consider you only purely based on your qualifications. Um, that's certainly a policy that could have been proposed, theoretically. But you can see how it can begin to play out that if we were just to promote a policy that I think is very closely in line with you know, uh, liberalism uh, rubric or ideology. Um, that, well, then employers receive applications and, uh, okay, this one is, uh, we'll select uh, this person because he has the most experience, graduated from this, from UCT, University of uh, Cape Town. Oh, by the way, it happens to be white. We'll see another one. Oh, by the way, it also happens to be white because of the systemic uh, right, uh, discrimination of the past. I think, I want to zoom in on one, in, in this issue in particular, the issue of the expectations at the time and whether South Africa could have withheld from the EE, from affirmative action. Surely the pressures were so great to see change that was visible and in a more, you know, that was, that was tangible. And also the, the pace of that change had to be pushed a little bit faster. Now, it seems controversial what I'm saying, but actually, one of the objectives, you could more broadly, about programs like this, and I'm not saying this as an endorsement of it, but just to, for, for some uh, conceptual clarity, it's basically about creating champions, putting for, for a certain group that has not been in higher level positions, professionals, doctors, managers, owners of business, and so on, and that has an effect that that can be demoralizing, that can be stigmatizing on, on, that, on that group. To have people in those positions, okay, the argument would go, it boosts the confidence, the morale, the stature of that group as a whole. So it's about creating certain champions. Now, ideally, in a way that, in, in, a, in, a, in a, through an intervention that is, that is temporary, okay, but it is principally a program that is not about which that is not about benefiting, uh, distributing benefits to the masses, and so I think to skip over in in uh, in in, in uh, Mr. Maimane, your presentation, 
to that which about to to uh, from to jump from this kind of program of grooming champions to helping the masses. I think it is a bit of a leap in that there could be other ways to deal with that uh, that objective in a way that can be uh, more 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 productive and with a bit more uh, restraint. Okay, you know when we. For instance, um, in, in employment equity, a more sequenced, uh, more sequenced approach to send uh, black, and here I'm using the black colour, and Indian uh, to, together to make it sequenced, or maybe that needs to be referenced to the availability of skilled uh, uh, people with, with the right uh, qualifications. Because we seem to apply a different logic when it comes to issues of race. And I don't think um, we realize that at times. If I were to propose, right, if I were to ask for opinions of how many people would support, a, uh, you know, uh, say in sports, right, a program that will groom Olympic champions, an elite sports program, I, I would reckon that there will be quite uh, widespread support for such a program, right? Uh, we wouldn't object to it on the basis that, oh, it's only benefiting a few people and it's not benefiting the masses. We shouldn't go with grooming Olympic champions. We should just put up playgrounds all over the place and then eventually maybe one or two people will be able to become Olympic champions. If we want Olympic champions, we, I think we would support a program that actually selects the people that is very uh, elitist because that's what the program is meant to do. Right? So I think, again, to come back to BE, um, I, I think there's a bit of a, uh, not really a coherence enough to, 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 uh, to jump from a, a criti critiquing the program, which certainly has, it, has its problems, towards one that is just benefiting the masses. Unless, unless we, we are in a situation where we can really defend the position that it is okay. It is okay if there are very few black industrialists. And I think that's the political uh, uh, challenge there, because to to advocate a program that is about micro enterprises um, is uh, you know is, is, is running the risk that you can end up in a situation where there are uh, that that uh, there are very few uh, black industrialists. And again, I think the circumstances of societies like Malaysia and, and, and South Africa uh, demand that you know, there has to be uh, some uh, attention to that objective, but doing it more effectively, and I don't, uh, but not necessarily, and I don't think, I just, uh, you know, I, I, yeah, I don't agree that it would, uh, the, the useful alternative is to then just say, let's spread benefits. Uh, to the masses, because I think that is a very ineffective way to be uh, developing uh, champions. So uh, I think I will just conclude then with, with that uh, 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 critique of uh, of uh, on on that on that uh, and the topic, and uh, and maybe we can uh, have a further conversation. Yes. Right, okay, brilliant. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lee. Uh, some some uh, interesting uh, comparison, comparative analysis there. And, uh, you know, points for the differences in the setup, the institutions, the, uh, in fact, the uh, uh, many institutional issues that you consider, and also your critique on the, the BE just now. I, I think uh, all this raises uh, quite a few questions. We're going to go into the dialogue now. Uh, I'm, I'm going to try to finish by about 9.30, 9.40, the latest. So, so that's the target. So who else? Who, who, yes, please. Uh, there's someone with the mic. Is that the mic coming on? No, there's no mic. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Don't worry.